labor and employee relations impacts nearly all other functional areas of human resource management. Understanding what both labor and employee relations mean and the impact each have on the organization is critical to effective human resource management. Workers join unions for many reasons. Higher wages, better benefits, a safer workplace, greater job security, and a voice. Skilled craftspeople were the first workers to unionize. By 1873, union membership had reached an astounding 300,000 in the United States. By 1878, however, membership was down to 50,000 due to the Depression. Then, in 1886, the American Federation of Labor was formed and unionism began to increase once again. Still, it wasn't till about 1933 that unions became firmly entrenched in the manufacturing sector, which helped in a membership upsurge. A pro-union U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and new legislation made it easier for unions to form and for membership to organize, which helped in the upsurge as well. In 1983, the union membership rate was 20.1%, but by 2013, union membership in the United States reached a record low of 11.3%. Two of the earliest pieces of labor legislation were the Railway Labor Act of 1926 and the Norris LaGuardia Act of 1935. This legislation was followed by the passage of three acts central to labor relations in the United States. The Wagner Act of 1935, the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, and the Landrum-Griffin Act of 1959. Jointly, these acts are referred to as the National Labor Code. Prior to the 19th century, five laws had been enacted to handle rail labor disputes. Nonetheless, labor unrest in the railroad industry continued. Violent strikes and lockouts interrupted rail transportation of people and goods in the United States, adversely affecting the economy. The Railway Labor Act, or RLA, was passed in 1926 to try to provide a peaceful way for railroads and their employees to resolve disputes. The RLA applies to the common carrier rail service and commercial airline employees, the latter of whom were included in the act through provisions passed by Congress in 1936. Besides providing a way for employees and railroads to peacefully resolve disputes, the RLA allows rail and airline employees to join labor unions. The act also distinguishes between minor and major disputes. Boards such as the National Railroad Adjustment Board settle minor disputes. Employees can engage in strikes for major disputes, but not minor ones. Employees can use lockouts for major disagreements. The X spells out provisions for handling major disputes, including collective bargaining guidelines, and created the National Mediation Board, or NMB, to handle these disputes and help parties resolve them. Congress passed the Norris LaGuardia Act in 1932 to make it easier for employees to engage in the union organizing activities. Before the passage of the act, employers had the full power when it came to how workers were treated. Even after passage of the Norris LaGuardia Act, relations between labor and management continued to deteriorate because management in many companies refused to allow unions to represent labor. These poor labor management relations cut across many industries from automotive to textile, from steel to trucking. In 1934, the country was in the midst of the Great Depression, and 1.5 million workers went out on strike. Many of the strikes became violent. A large number of strikes were about wage increases, but one-third of them were over the right of unions to be recognized. Congress subsequently passed the Nab National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA, known as the Wagner Act, in 1935. The act is often regarded as the most important piece of labor relations legislation. The act was passed for three main reasons. First, to protect the rights of employees and employers. Second, to encourage the parties to engage in collective bargaining. And third, to control their activities so the economy wouldn't be adversely affected. The Wagner Act established the National Labor Relations Board to oversee the act. Let's take a look at some of the specific provisions of the Act relative to employee rights, unfair labor practices, and workers not covered by the NLRA, and the establishment of the National Labor Relations Board. 
The NLRA protects private sector employees from employer and union misconduct, such as attempts by employers to prevent unions from organizing and attempts by unions to coerce employees to join them. The NLRA also ensures that employees have the right to organize a union when none currently exists. The specific rights provided under the NLRA to employees include the following. 1. To form or attempt to form a union at their workplace. 2. To join a union, even if it's not recognized by their employer. 3. To assist in union organizing efforts. 4. To engage in group activities, such as collective bargaining, or attempting to modify wages or working conditions. 5. To refuse to do any or all of the above unless a clause requiring employees to join a union exists. The NLRA also provides rights to employees who are not a part of a union. These employees have the right to engage in concerted activity. Concerted activity exists when two or more employees act together to try to improve working conditions or when a single employee approaches management after conferring with other employees on their behalf or is acting on behalf of other employees. For example, if two employees or more talk with their employer about improving their pay, or if an employee does so on behalf of one or more of his or her coworkers, these employees have engaged in protected concerted activity. Unfair labor practices, or ULPs, are violations of the NLRA that deny rights and benefits to employees and can be the result of employer or union activity. Such violations include threatening to take the jobs or benefits of employees who attempt to form a union, reassigning workers to less attractive jobs than their current ones if they're involved in union activities, and telling employees they will receive greater benefits if they don't join a union. Labor unions violate the NLRA when they tell employees they will lose their jobs if they don't join a union or when union employees are on strike, they bar non-strikers from entering an employer's premises. Specifically, Section 8 of the Act defines the following ULPs. 1. Interfering with, restraining, or coercing employees in the exercise of their rights guaranteed in Section 7 of the Act. 2 dominating or interfering with the formation or administration of any labor organization or contributing financial or other support to it. 3. Discriminating against employees in terms of their hiring, tenure of employment, or any other term or condition of employment so as to encourage or discourage them from becoming members of a labor organization. 4 discouraging or otherwise discriminating against employees because they file charges or give testimony under the Act. 5. Refusing to bargain collectively with the duty chosen representative of employees. Although the Act identifies these unpractices as unfair, it didn't make them crimes or impose any penalties or fines on people or organization for their occurrence. The National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, is the agency of the United States government that was created by Congress to administer the NLRA. The agency has two main functions. One is to prevent and remedy unfair labor practices on the part of either labor organization or employers, and the second is to decide whether groups of employees want labor union representation so they can engage in collective bargaining. The decision is based on the results of secret ballot elections the NLRB conducts for employees. Two components of the agency are the board and general counsel. The board is made up of five members, appointed to five-year terms by the President of the United States and approved by the United States Senate. Their role is quasi-judicial and involves making decision in administrative proceedings. The president also appoints the general counsel, an attorney, to investigate and prosecute unfair labor practices and supervise the NLRB field offices as they process cases. The general counsel is appointed to a four-year term and must be approved by the Senate as well. For 12 years after its passage, the NLRA was perceived by many as giving too much power to unions. In response, Congress passed the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, commonly known as the Taft-Hartley Act. President Truman subsequently vetoed the act, but Congress overrode his veto. 
The main purpose of the act is to protect the rights of employees and make the NLRB a more impartial referee for industrial relations rather than having it serve as an advocate for organized labor. The following are some of the provisions of the act. 1. To promote the free flow of commerce. 2 to prescribe the legitimate rights of employees and employers and their relations affecting commerce. 3. To provide orderly and peaceful procedures and preventing employees and employers from interfering with the legitimate rights of the other party. 4. To protect the rights of individual employees in their relations with labor organizations. And 5. To protect the rights of the public in connection with labor disputes affecting commerce. The act increased the reach of government regulation of collective bargaining and added new sanctions for violations in addition to those already existing under the Wagner Act. The Taft-Hartley Act also specified that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, would maintain a file of collective bargaining agreements. The BLS now collects agreements for over 1,000 or more workers. These files are accessible through the BLS office in Washington, D.C. Among the most significant outcomes of the Taft-Hartley Act, or the Labor Management Relations Act, was the provision that employees cannot be forced to join a union. 24 states have passed right-to-work laws that prevent workers from having to join a union as a condition of employment be forced to not join a union as a condition of employment, or be forced to pay union dues, or be fined for not paying such dues. Organizations such as the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation and the National Right to Work Committee work to ensure the rights of workers are not violated. The role of the foundation is to work through the courts to support individuals who have become victims of forced unionization. The committee's lobby state legislatures and Congress to eliminate forced unionism and works to educate people about right-to-work laws. Regardless of whether a state is a right-to-work state, the Taft-Hartley Act has led to safeguard for workers who do not wish to be forced to become union members and redefined what types of union shops are legal under collective bargaining agreements. The most extreme form of a union membership is a closed shop. A closed shop requires workers to join the union before they can be hired and requires employers go through the union first to hire new employees. Only if a union employees are not available can an employer recruit non-union employees. The Taft-Hartley Act generally outlawed closed shops and ended the right of unions to decide who could become members of the union. Under a union shop agreement, all workers except managers in an organizational unit represented by a union have to become members of the union within a certain period of time after being hired, or at least pay equivalent union dues. This type of agreement is referred to as a union security clause. Union shops are illegal in right-to-work states. Under an agency shop agreement, employees cannot be required to join a union but can be required to pay a union an amount equivalent to initiation fees and dues that are considered to be a tax or service charged and are referred to as an agency fee. In exchange for these payments, the union acts as the bargaining agent for the employee. In reality, workers who are not union members can be required to pay an amount equivalent to reduced union dues solely for the purpose of supporting the collective bargaining, contract administration, and grievance resolution services the union provides. The last part of the National Labor Relations Code, the Landrum-Griffin Act, protects union members from being abused by unions. It outlines the responsibilities of union officers as well as the rights of union members via a Bill of Rights that gives union members the right to free speech and due process, the opportunity to be involved in the nomination process for the election of union leaders, the right to receive copies of collective bargaining agreements, and the right to sue their unions. Let's now provide an overview of the different types of unions and discuss why they exist and how they are related. The types of unions have evolved over time and include local unions, city and statewide federations of local unions, and international unions. Local unions later joined together to form city and state federations. Statewide federations joined together to form national unions, and many of these have now become international unions. 
Local unions protect the interests of workers in a particular craft trade or industry. For instance, Local Number no. 9 of the International Union of Operating Engineers is located in Denver, Colorado. Its members are in the stationary, skilled building maintenance trades. Members' dues are used to pay for worker representation and collective bargaining efforts and set through a vote of its members. Today, the lines between craft unions and industrial unions are blurring, but there are still some distinctions. Craft unions are organized to represent the interests of members with specialized craft skills. Industrial unions have traditionally represented semi-skilled and unskilled workers in a particular industry. Local unions are voluntary associations of workers who have banded together because of their shared economic interests. They might work for the same employer or several employers. In any case, the members recognize that the union provides them with a greater voice and resp re respect them to represent their interests that they wouldn't otherwise achieve alone. Each member is entitled to one vote, and decisions are made by a majority vote of the union. Elected officers and executive board are empowered to act on behalf of the union. Members remain in good standing as long as they pay their dues and other required fees and follow the guidelines for membership. The goal of most local unions is to improve the wages, benefits, and working conditions of its members. A local union also provides grievance mechanisms for its members with an employer. After a local union is organized at an organization, the union elects a union steward to serve as a liaison between the rest of the employees and the leadership of the union. The union steward is an employee of the company who serves the role voluntarily. Typically, the formal agreement between the union and the employer will specify the role of a union steward, including the amount of work time the steward can spend on union activities. In essence, an international union is a parent for local unions. Workers are members of the local union rather than the international. However, local union dues pay to the international union. International unions hold regularly scheduled conventions in which delegates from local unions participate. The international union elects officers and an executive board from these delegates. International union provides service to local unions that would be more costly or difficult to provide locally. Conducting a union election costs about $1,000 per worker, whether the union wins or loses. In 2013, there were 1,986 NLRB-conducted certification elections, down from more than 7,000 per year in the 1960s. When a group of employees decides they would like to be represented by a union, their first step is to file a petition with the NLRB. Employees in the designated work unit, referred to as the bargaining unit, provide a dated signature on either a union authorization card or a signature sheet indicating that they're interested in being represented by a particular union. At least 30% of the eligible union employees must provide this card for the NLRB to consider the petition. The NLRB then assigns an agent from the appropriate regional field office to process the petition. The regional office of the NLRB holds a secret ballot election, usually at the workplace. A majority vote in favor of the union is all that's required. The NLRB then certifies that the union represents the employee for collective bargaining purposes and requires the employer to bargain with the union. One of the most challenging parts of the certification process is determining who is actually eligible to sign the card. The bargaining unit can consist of workers in a single location or from multiple locations. The bargaining unit can be also be limited to a specific group of workers in a single department. The NLRB determines who is eligible to be part of the bargaining unit or union and the employer jointly make this decision. Regardless of who makes the decision, the company is required to supply the NLRB with a list of names and addresses for employees who are eligible to vote in the representation election within seven days of after the NLRB has indicated that an election will be held. This is known as the Excelsior List. Federal law does provide an alternative route under which a union can be recognized by an employer outside the NLRB process. Employers can voluntarily recognize a union if employees show majority support either through signed authorization cards or some other route. 
when the employer voluntarily recognizes a union as the bargaining representative for a group of employees, the status of the union cannot be challenged for a period of six months to one year after the first bargaining session occurs. A card check is the process whereby a company recognizes a union once the union has produced evidence that the majority of workers have signed authorization cards indicating that they want the union to represent them. No election is held. Under a neutrality agreement, a company agrees that it will not express its views about unionization during the time when signatures are collected. Unions prefer card checks and neutrality agreements because the NLRB does not become involved in the union certification process, and management loses its right to speak out about the possible effects of unionization. Collective bargaining is the process that labor unions and employers use to reach agreement about wages, benefits, hours worked, and other terms and conditions of employment. Let's discuss each next. The NLRB requires that employers and unions bargain in good faith. Good faith bargaining requires the parties to meet at a reasonable time and come to the bargaining table ready to reach collective bargaining agreement. Mandatory bargaining topics must be negotiated and include compensation and benefits, hours of employment, and other terms and conditions of employment. Pensions, insurance, grievance processes, safety, layoffs, discipline, and union security have also become mandatory bargaining topics. The law does not require an employer and a union to actually reach an agreement on the topics, only that they bargain in good faith. The bargaining process can also address issues such as employee rights, management control, and benefits for retired union members. However, these topics are not mandatory and referred to as permissive topics. Actions that constitute bad faith bargaining include bargaining with individual employees rather than union representatives, referring to meet at a reasonable time to engage in bargaining, and going through the motions of bargaining without the intent of reaching an agreement. Other activities that may or may not be considered bad faith bargaining, including not being willing to schedule enough bargaining sessions and applying economic pressure to the other party. As a manager, you will find that there are many times when you're involved in negotiations. You will have to negotiate with customers, vendors, and employees. And even if you do not, do not actually represent your company in collective bargaining negotiations, you might be asked to provide those who do with certain information. Regardless of the type of negotiation, there are a few critical steps that should be followed to reach the best possible solution. These steps apply to the collective bargaining process as well. First, being prepared. Second, knowing the interests of the other party and understanding the consequences of not reaching an agreement. There are two commonly used types of negotiation strategies in labor negotiations, distributive and integrative bargaining. When a distributive bargaining strategy is used, there's a winner and loser. In an integrative bargaining strategy, either party is more cooperative and works to make a win-win solution. Interest-based bargaining, or IBB, is basically an extension of integrated bargaining. Brainstorming, information sharing, and other techniques are used to ensure that lines of communication between the two parties are kept open. The goal is to reach a consensus that both parties win. What happens when both parties can't reach an agreement? The outcome can be a strike, a lockout, or arbitration. When an impasse occurs, there are several options. First, an outside party, such as the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, can be called in to negotiate. This facilitation can take the form of conciliation, which involves keeping the parties working on the agreement until they resolve the issues at hand. It also can take the form of mediation, which involves an outside party working with each side to reach agreement. Finally, arbitration can be used to resolve issues. Unlike conciliation mediation, arbitration involves a process where a third party makes a decision about the issue. Most collective bargaining agreements outline formal steps that must be followed to settle disputes between labor and management. These steps make the grievance process. Officially, a grievance is a written charge by one or more employees that management has violated contractual rights. The grievance process typically works as follows. First, the problem is reported to one's immediate supervisor, who's obligated to investigate the matter and try to resolve the issue. The report can be written or oral, but it's usually written. 
The supervisor should then work with the union steward to resolve the problem. If the union steward does not believe that the problem is getting legitimate grievance, no further action is taken. If these effects do not result in resolution, it goes to the next level of supervision. This time, the employee filing the grievance is represented by the union. Failure to resolve the grievance at this stage within the time allotted in the collective bargaining agreement results in the grievance being taken to a higher level of management. The highest level of resolution for the grievance is spelled out in the union contract. If the grievance is still not resolved, the final step in the grievance process would be to call an arbitrator. The employee's right to have a union representative involved in the process of disciplinary hearings resulted in large part from the 1975 landmark U.S. Supreme Court case NLRB v. Weingarten, Inc. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled that a union representative could be present when a supervisor conducted an investigatory interview to gather information that could result in the employee being questioned or disciplined or when an employer asks an employee to defend his or her actions. As a result of the case, managers have to notify union representatives of the purpose of the interview. In addition, the employee has the right to select which union employee will be present. If employees in a collective bargaining unit decide they no longer want to be part of the union, they can petition the NLRB for decertification. Decertification means that the union will no longer represent the employees or engage in collective bargaining on their behalf. A decertification petition can only be filed within 90 days of the expiration of a collective bargaining agreement currently in force. As with certification, at least 30% of the employees in the bargaining unit must indicate they no longer want to be represented by the union. A secret ballot election is a requirement of decertification. In 2010, the NLRB started to receive complaints about employer social media policies. The NLRB responded by issuing three reports in 2011 and 2012 that described the results of investigations into social media cases. The following is a summary of the findings and conclusions of those reports. Employees who discuss terms and conditions of employment with fellow employees via social media are engaging in protected concerted activity. Employee complaints via social media about work that are not related to a group activity among employees are not protected activity. Employer policies need to be carefully crafted so they do not prohibit activities such as discussion of wages and working conditions that are protected by federal labor laws. Unions can be found guilty of unlawful coercive conduct by how they use social media.